You know, it, it, it is, in finding out some of the things that you've done, reading about them and all, um, it's amazing how much is the director's work and how little the actors are needed. And uh, in a way, you, you, there's a devastating example you gave from a Russian filmmaker, Pudovkin. Yes. It had to do with the actor's face and then the... Uh, well, uh, if explain. I may interrupt you a moment, mm -hmm. Walt Disney had the right idea. <laughs> if he didn't like the actors, he tore them up. <laughs> But uh, you talked about the, the, the Russian filmmaker. Ah, the power of film. That, that, yeah. That's uh, how strong film can be. Yeah. Well, I did the production section for Encyclopedia Britannica for the yeah. last edition. And in it, I describe a scene such as in the picture Rear Window, yes, where you have a... James Stewart, a close-up of him, and he looks, you see, and you cut, we'll say, for example, a woman nursing a baby. Now you go back to Mr. Stewart, and he smiles. So what have you demonstrated? That he's a nice, benevolent gentleman. Now take the middle piece of film away. He looks, he sees. Now cut to a girl in a bikini, and he smiles. Now he's a dirty old man. <laughs> and it's the exact same smile. Exact same smile, yeah. the same look. The subject has changed. Mm -hmm. And you said that there's even, even more dramatic example. That was the Russian filmmaker who showed an actor's face and then a dead baby, and they then did, the actor's face, uh, yes, and then a bowl of soup, and then the actor's face. And in each case, it was the same shot of the actor's face. But in the one seemed to be sorrow, and the other seemed to be hunger. Hunger, that's and quite could, true, yes, yes. So you could get an Academy Award performance for an actor with only one shot of him, really. Well, I did it years ago with an actress, and uh, I found her very difficult. And uh, I did all her close-ups and said, look here, look there, look down, look across, move around. And go home. And go, then you may go home. And I brought in <laughs> another actress, yeah. and I used all her hands, and she was cutting meat, and, uh, and it was the prelude to a murder scene. And you just put everything around it? I used the hands only, yes. See. Is there a scene you wouldn't do over again? Are you, are you sorry you did some? I'm thinking of one specifically, of the boy with the bomb. Well, that was because I made the terrible mistake of, of having a boy carry a bomb across the city. Mm -hmm. You, the audience, knew that it was a bomb. And I built it up and up until the various clocks and all the holdups and you knew it was going to go off at one o'clock, but I let the clocks go one minute past one, two minutes, and work the audience up, and then I let the bomb go off. And he was on a bus, and it blew the whole thing completely. And uh, I remember I was at the press show, and a woman critic came up with both raised fists and said, how dare you do a thing like that? Even a hard-boiled critic was taken away with the whole thing. I'd made the mistake in not relieving them at the end of the suspense. In other had... words, if you mm -hmm. put an audience through the mill like that, you must relieve it. The bomb must be found and quickly thrown out of the window. Then it goes off out there and the audience are relieved. And if you had it to do over again? I'd never let the bomb go off. Gee. What would you do with the rest of the movie? Um, well, I mean, uh, well, that wouldn't be the last scene in the movie. No, that's true. But is it, was it because the, uh, was it also because a child was killed in the scene that they thought it was too brutal? No, I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason is that uh, an audience gets worked up. Yeah. And they need relief. For example, if anybody goes on a roller coaster, mm -hmm. they scream, it goes down the big dip and up and around, they're screaming all the time but always get off giggling. Yeah. Or you go to the midway and you pay money to go into the haunted house and skeletons jump up and the floor does all kinds of things, but they always come out giggling. Now the question, why do people pay money to be scared? Do you know the answer? Of course not. <laughs> I earn my living doing it. <laughs> Better not to question it. What would my starving wife and child do without us? <laughs> or your starving self. For that yes, idea. that's right. <laughs> <laughs>
We, uh, by the way, I should explain, there's always somebody who misunderstands. A child was not killed in the making of the movie. It was in the scene itself, supposedly. Someone always writes in and has misunderstood. We'll be back after this. We'll be here. Talking with uh, the master, Alfred Hitchcock. You always have appeared in your film somewhere. I know that became a problem for you because you found that people watched for it so that you had to do it early in the film to get it out of the way after, the, after it became known. Uh, but in Lifeboat, you were out at s every, the whole cast was out at sea in a lifeboat, and there was no way, unless you pedaled past on one of those machines, uh, you could do that. I swam past as a whale, you mean. <laughs> Spouting. <laughs> no, in that film, I had to appear in an ad. It, it was during the time that uh, I was taking some weight off. I know it sounds like a lie, but I was. Yes. But it always gets back on. And I appeared in an ad called Reduso. And it was being read by William Bendix. And the ad showed me before and after. So you got into the film. I got into way. the film. Were, were those actors miserable in that lifeboat? Uh, uh, that with... Well, um, some of them were. Of course, we had the famous Tallulah Bankhead, who yeah. was great fun. And one of the young ladies in the, um, in the boat had great ambitions to become a film star. And uh, I discovered that she was stuffing Kleenex into her brassiere <laughs> to build herself up. And one day she said to me, oh, Mr. Hitchcock, which do you think is my best side? And I said, you're sitting on it, my dear. <laughs> And that girl today, uh, well, I guess we, we won't have. Probably uh, still sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> they say that uh, some people who uh, are offended by the shocking things in your films or the scary things, and, and yet lately they've begun to say that what seemed depraved to some of the earlier critics has become commonplace today and that you were really ahead of your time. Um, does that mean anything to you? Do you believe that? No, it means I've got to get more ahead than ever. In other words, avoid the cliché. Where will you, where will you go? Ah, uh -huh. we don't know. Can't tell us. Where, where is the fun for it in you? Uh, uh, the fun in it for you, I mean. Uh, what is funny? No, Making the a picture like Psycho. That's Fu hilarious to me. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be. If, if we're designing the film, I'm sitting with the writer, and you say, well, uh, wouldn't it be fun to kill them this way or that way? Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, this scene will make them scream. <laughs> so you do it with a sort of um, lushness of, <laughs> of enjoyment. And no different to the man who's driving the nails in that scaffolding who's making the roller coaster. Mm. He knows they're going to scream eventually. You laugh and all there's that fine line between fear and, and what is comic, you see. The audience have this tremendous fear when they go on the roller coaster, mm -hmm. and when they get off, they're, they're laughing. They, they've recovered. 